Good evening, folks. It's Diamond with the Oppenheimer Ranch Project and Magnetic Reversal News, bringing you a grand solar minimum update Wednesday, September 11th, 1145 p.m. Mountain Time, 2019. Take a look at the GFS models. The snow is just increasing and increasing. It keeps going and going and going like the Energizer Bunny. That's not that funny. We have snow picking up in the Sierras and more areas than we did yesterday. And not only that, three tropical disturbances in the Atlantic lining up straight off the tip of Africa. And number two, with 0% chance of cyclone formation in 48 hours, is looking like in 72 hours, it may form into a hurricane, one that hits the Bahamas as a Cat 3, Cat 4 on these models. Now, models could be schmodels, but I want to bring this out here. I want to put this out there in the ether right now. This is nine days out on the model, showing a hurricane hitting the southern Bahamas and headed towards Florida. 9-11, never forget, edition. Keep calm, it's boom time. Prepared, not scared. It's National Preparedness Month 2019. The National Preparedness Month is recognized each September to promote family and community disaster and emergency planning now and throughout the year. And the 2019 theme, can you believe it? Prepared, not scared. I wonder who's watching whose channel. As Weather Ready Nation ambassadors, we will be talking about preparedness all month. We've been talking about it for two years. Weather alert. Drifting snow keeps Trail Ridge Road in Rocky Mountain National Park closed. It's still summer, but there are Colorado roads closing due to snow. The famous road that connects the two sides of Rocky Mountain National Park will close Wednesday night due to the possibility of snow above 10,000. In Estes Park, sure, it might still technically be summer, but drifting snow can be a bummer. Colorado weather, summer cold front brings severe weather and mountain snow. He's touching Alien Allen down there by Salida. That's really weird. Denver CBS 4, a late summer cold front will sweep over Colorado on Wednesday, bringing afternoon thunderstorms to the mountains, overnight light snow above 10,000 feet, and an enhanced threat for severe weather to the far northeast corner of the state. That is your fate. First snow of the season falls in Utah, Wyoming, as mountain areas of Nevada and other places see the snow. There may still be nearly two weeks of summer officially left, but winter is making its comeback and come back quickly. High elevation areas of Utah, Wyoming saw their first snow of the season Tuesday, while mountain locales in Nevada near Lake Tahoe also saw some of the frozen precip. Tahoe? Say it ain't so! It's so September snow at Tahoe. Yeah, sort of. Because we live in a global warming world, we put that there. I mean... Can it be any more obvious? But you know, out in the high country, it felt more like winter yesterday. <laughs> yeah, take a look at your screen here. This is video from the Mount Rose Highway out in Nevada. And no, that is not hail, that is snow in those higher elevations there. Yeah. You know this area very well, right? Yeah, so this is just uh, in the south of Reno. If you are headed up toward the Incline Village side of Lake Tahoe, this is on the other side of the hill going back toward Reno. But it's amazing to see the white stuff on the side of the road <laughs> in September. Yes, yeah, so again, this happened yesterday afternoon. We had a low pressure system moving over us. Some cooler air filtering in. And huh. so with, uh, you know, the rain and the instability, we did is get some snow. Is that how you make snow? Yeah. It's the cold air over the, with the rain? Oh, my God. Those guys are great. September snow at Tahoe. Yeah. Not sort of. Yeah. Back to the GFS model. Let's break it down. We're going to see heavy snow moving into British. First snow falls in Colorado, Wyoming, and Montana in the next 24 to 48 hours. Hours of powers. And then heavy snow moving into British Columbia and Alberta. And then a cacophony all throughout the West and the high mountain regions. As we enter fall, the first day of fall, before fall, here's the first day of fall, and there is snow everywhere. And then boom! Heads up, Canada. 
let's talk about the tropical disturbances. Number 50% formation here. Uh, this baby's going to move up through Florida, linger all the way up the, uh, pan the peninsula here. Uh, move over towards Alabama and straight up through Bama. Now on all the models, it's looking like that S turn. So heads up, Alabama, for a wet one for several days as this disturbance moves up. Now, according to the windy model here, and we're, let me just move my face here out in the middle of the ocean. I can even make it bigger. Look how big my face is. Holy shit. It's a disgrace. Can I make it wider? No, I can only go one way. It's all new. Oh, holy macaroni. So we're on the ECMFW, by the way. In case you can't re read down here, that's the glowing area. And according to the ECMFW, uh, this baby turns into a hurricane right down here in the Turks and Caicos sometime on Wednesday. It doesn't look like it's going to impact the D Dominican or Puerto Rico much as it is just developing right here over Puerto Rico as a tropical storm develops on Tuesday, which will be their lose day in the Bahamas if this happens. That is one, two, three. This is about not even five days out. So th this model, it could be quite accurate. That's all I'm saying. We got about a 50% chance of this happening at this point. In which case, it would be a devastating tornado, and it would add insult to injury by taking out the rest of the Bahamas, including Pedophile Island, on these models. Just saying. Let me move my face back down here and make it smaller. USDA takes another swing at corn yield. Acreage estimates on Thursday. That's tomorrow. And here's the problem. There are millions and millions of acres of corn that hasn't even gotten to stage two or three. And there are millions of acres of soybean that haven't even flowered. And if we start to get these snows and some frosts in here in the next few weeks, what they're reporting on as actual yield could be a zero. As of th Sunday, there were over 9 million acres of corn that have not hit the dough growth development stage. That still leaves two more stages, dent and black layer. And then the late planted corn has yet to re reach it. I mean, there's no corn. Now, there's 6 million acres of soybeans that haven't even started setting pods. The new national record for this time of year, by the way. The seed fill and maturity stage follow the pod setting. So first the pods have to set. And if there's a frost, hello, no beans. And so on and so forth. So we're really far away. USDA reported Monday that 10% of Illinois soybeans had not set pod. 16% of Indiana, 11% of Kansas, 11% of Michigan, 16% of Missouri, 11% of Ohio, and 15% of Wisconsin. That's all loss. So we're going to be watching this closely as the USDA continues to stick their <whistles> between their legs. Months worth of rain targets British Columbia coast this weekend, as well as that mountain snow. Ho, ho, ho. And Squamish, heads up. We showed it to you. Beastie ploys. Well, they're getting fancy. How to prepare homes for the worst winter in decades as beasts from the east to bring minus 15 sea lows. Watch the video. Brits are being urged to prepare for the worst winter in decades as the beast from the east 3.0 looks set to return and plunge the UK into temperatures of minus 15 C. People are being warned to take extra safety precautions with temperatures tipping the tippy top of the tipple of the plunge to amongst the lowest levels seen in three decades. I know, it's plush, but it may not be enough. The 2018 beast from the east saw 17 people die as the mercury dropped to minus 14 C, with its winter arctic spell predicted to be even colder this year. Freezing conditions could last for weeks, according to experts from the University of College London. 
British Gas has advised Brits to prepare themselves for the bitterly cold and infrastructure failing and them freezing themselves to death and maybe eating the neighbors. And that's tonight's first boom. Maunder Minimum style. <clears throat> Have you seen the latest uh, modus? Holy sh... This is the composite September 3rd through 9th. This is the maximum melt, meaning it will... No more ice will melt. And please, look at Greenland and look at all of the ice in the Arctic. And then... Oh my God. Would you look at that? Would you just look at it? Thank you, modus. Actual satellite footage, composite, of the Northern Hemisphere, looking directly down at the North Pole, showing that the Northern Passage, Northwestern Passage, was never open hmm. to travel. Imagine that. Actual footage. As the ice grows, UN warns food is going to get really, really expensive, and they blame it on you burning up. So we'll shut that down. Cannibalism. <laughs> That's the answer. Professor says eating human flesh will save the planet from climate change. Hmm. So all you have to do is eat your neighbor. Scientists say eating human flesh will save the planet from climate change. I can't even believe what I'm reading. A Swedish scientist suggests that it may be necessary to turn to cannibalism and start eating human flesh to save the planet, giving new meaning to the expression, bite me. And he can suck it. And no, this story is not from The Onion. A conference about food of the future called Gastro Summit being held in Stockholm, Sweden, featured a presentation by Magnus Sudolond claiming that we must get used to the idea of eating people in the future as a way of combating climate change. That sounds, that makes sense. Makes sense to me. The controversy over Jonathan Franzen's climate change opinions explained. Well, there are all types of loonies in the climate alarmist realms. There are the global warmists, there's the all we're all burning upists, and there's the go for brokeists, and there's the no informationists, and there's the I've never checked any data everists, and then there's this guy, this author dude and he's like hey if we're all gonna die and it's inevitable then why are we why would we do anything why don't we just mitigate the end of the everything why don't we just if it's gonna happen why would we do anything skullduggery taken to the nth degree of schmuckery jonathan franzen writes about climate change and the response is just as insane and douchey as all of the alarmists are. Here's Stuart Capstick, who can stick a chapstick right up his... <whistles> climate change is dubious and irrelevant. No point in cutting emissions. Yes. Carbon dioxide is plant food. The emissions we should cut are everything but carbon dioxide. You idiot. Chapstick lover. Number two. Climate change is apocalyptic and impossible, and there's no point in cutting emissions. Both of these choices are correct, Stuart. Seismic update. No quakes of note. We had some deep blot echo here I was worried about earlier in the day, 5.5 in Fiji, but it was followed by some aftershocks in a cacophony in a string, which is moving that energy to the north. So, no more worries there. No more worries globally. Interesting quake on the New Madrid region. 2.6 in Bon Terre, Missouri. Where there may be misery. Mount Hood volcano could erupt with little warning and devastating consequences, New York Times warns. Well, would we believe that? Well, Oregon's Mount Hood active volcano lacks adequate monitoring, scientists say. I'll believe that. Not the New York Times. So there's no monitoring on this mountain. So when it goes, it's boom time. Extinct volcano could wake up. It's not extinct. 
in case you didn't know, Oregon's Mount Hood is active and just erupted as recent as within the last 200 years, as well as over a dozen other volcanoes. What's going on? We, we don't watch commercials here. Please close that. Mount Hood, as well as a dozen other volcanoes, erupted during the Dalton Minimum. And it is our prediction that a similar amount in the next decade or so will be erupting on the West Coast. Heads up. Chilean rehearsal. Chileans rehearse evacuation as southern volcano rumbles. This is Villa Rica. And in Santiago, coming out today, Chilean authorities in the country's south have begun rehearsing evacuation plans amid concern an active volcano could potentially erupt within days or weeks. And that's Villa Rica. And look at these people. Volcano Villa Rica, near the popular tourist resort of Pucan, around 460 miles south of Santiago, was upgraded to an amber alert after it began rumbling and hurling lava into the air late on Tuesday. And it was spectacular. Look at that. That is gorgeous. Let's just blow that up. I mean, that's like beyond dab worthy. Whoa! That really wasn't a blow up. It's the same picture. That's actually bigger. <coughs> anyway... The Amber Alert by National Geology and Mining Service, Cerna Geomin, implies a significant increase in activity, by the way. Alvedo Amigo, head of the National Network of Volcano Vigilance for Sergominan, said Villarica could erupt within days or weeks. And if you just go like this, it's like tweaks. But we are volcano geeks, so... We will watch it. Chile has the second largest number of most active volcanoes in the world behind Indonesia. So this could be the place where it all begins or ends. However you want to look at it. Worldwide volcano news update. Nevado de Chilan puffing and passing, which bring, which reminds me. <laughs> no tobacco products on the show completely would be demonetized. Worldwide Volcano News Update. Nevados Chilan puffing to 14,000 feet. Explosive activity continues at the Nevados de Chilan. We have a Bico eruption. Aso. As well as Popo, Carangitang, Ducono, Reventador, and Santa Guito. As well as Alaid. Have you gotten Alaid recently? Well, you have now Northern Kuril's explosive activity continues. Volcanic ash advisory from VOC showing the FL to, you know, 10,000 feet. That's 0. 0.0100. Holy macaroni. Reventador, Sangue API. Reventador, uh, ongoing volcanic ash to 15,000 feet. That's not insignificant. That's three miles up, yo. And Popo puffing to 21,000 feet. And you know how I'm a foot guy. You know that. Strange alien world found to have water vapor and possibly rain clouds. That sounds like Earth. Is this it? Is this the reveal? Is that an artist's impression? In a major first, scientists have detected water vapor and possibly even humans. No, liquid water clouds that rain in the atmosphere of a strange exoplanet. So strange, it's just like ours. It lies in the habitable zone of its host star about 110 light years from Earth. That isn't even that fucking far. I can astral that, man. A new study focuses on K2-18b, an exoplanet discovered in 2015, orbits a red dwarf star. Oh my God, like the purple dawn. Close enough to receive about the same amount of radiation from its star as Earth does. Sunburn much? Previously, scientists have discovered gas giants that have water vapor in their atmosphere. But this is the least Massive planet ever to have water vapor detected in the atmosphere. Doesn't that sound like it's less? Anyway, the new paper even goes so far as to suggest that this planet has terrible subway systems, DMVs that blow, and a bunch of other shit, including taxes on carbon dioxide. Bunch of pricks. Oh, God. 
can't even make this up, although I just did. We might have found another interstellar comet. Amoamoa much. And this one's coming closer than Amoamoa much. <coughs> Give me a minute. Okay, I'm back. Take a look at the eccentricity of that non-eccentric orbit. It's almost like a straight line. Straight up from Jesus, straight down from heaven, just to hook in here and go right down to hell. See how that works? It's almost like it was prophesized. On August 30th, astronomers at the Crimean Astrophysicists Observatory detected what looked like a perfectly ordinary comet. <laughs> Were they wrong? Excitement is rising with each new observation of the movements through the skies. Astronomers now think the object currently known as GB00234. And if you Google that, that's also like the, an, a part number for like something you can buy. Because I did it. Anyway, it's a hyperbolic orbit unlike anything we've ever seen except a mua mua. A mua mua much. If you don't know what I'm talking about, then I don't even know why you're watching the channel. But C2019 Q4 Bordisov, which we also now know as GB00234, is an interstellar comet with a heliocentric orbital eccentricity of approximately three and is not bound to the sun, which means it's bound to some other shit from some other place that came here one time. Now, anyway, uh, it has a hyperbolic excess velocity of 30 kilometers per second under 3 kilometers per second explained by the Oort cloud perturbations, which doesn't even exist and is also a fantasy, but they can be explained by that. So this one discovered 30th of August, just two days after my birthday at Margo Nanuc by Gengel Borisov using his custom built 0.65 meter telescope is going to take names. This thing, this baby is coming, and we'll get to that. And it's coming hard. I'm stoked for this. A few more diagrams of GB00234 realize these assume the nominal hyperbolic trajectory is correct of what it will actually do. Are we about to watch this? I better like this again. Holy shit. I didn't even know there was video. But apparently, we're going to get the gif. Take a look. There it is. There she is, coming straight in with a hyperbolic arc of nothing. Look at this. Keep coming. Oh, my gosh. Can we enlarge this? How do we do it? What's happening? Oh, my goodness. I bet you if we just put it over here, we can gif it out. It's just give me a tweeter. Okay, that didn't work for us. So let's check out Tony Dunn. If you come over to the IFL Science, you will be able to see the uh, the diagrams here. But the hyperbolic arc is going to bring this comet in almost straight in, perpendicular to the... And just hook around the sun as it leaves at a very rapid speed. Now, based on the uh, data and the performance of a muamua, what happens with these highly hyper, these low hyperbolic uh, objects as they come in in almost a straight line? They actually get whipped around here in this arc, and a muamua accelerated out of here, which is why everybody got their panties in a bunch and thought it was a spaceship. And they were like, oh my God, it's Earth! It sucks! Let's get the fuck out of here! So they went, zoom! But that's not how it works. It has more to do with inertia and electromagnetism and if this has a negative charge or the opposite charge of the sun itself or the planetary disk area that it's in it will literally be repelled like a magnet away which will look like acceleration and make everyone think it's an alien ship but it's not it's just an electromagnet not that fancy but some of the shit in the middle of the uh, Milky Way is blowing my mind. And I'm talking about bubbles. 
Now, what you're looking at is the galactic center. This is where the black hole is that just uh, emanated some shit out of it that no one can explain. And let me shrink my head down because I am unimportant here. And this is amazing. So what you're looking at here is the galactic plane of the Milky Way here. This is that, this horizontal here. And these wispy things called the plasmoids or the gods at the center of our galaxy um, are absolutely unexplained by anything in traditional or classical theory of cosmology. None. Um, but they are explained wholly if you go check out the Thunderbolts project at thunderbolts.info and the electric universe model. And in fact, the black hole of the Milky Way is somewhere in here, which is being uh, hidden by these plasmoids. But now let's bring this out. Look at these bubbles. They're like gigantic Fermi bubbles, a hundred light years across. Look at this. This is just the edge of one glowing. Clearly it goes out here. There's a bubble here I can see, another bubble here. Here's a bubble. There's a bubble everywhere, a bubble, bubble. Now, not only that, take the galactic plane of the Milky Way here where all this energetic stuff is happening. Look at all this electricity right here. Look at this wisp here connecting to what looks like a big bubble down here and an upper bubble down up here. This almost looks uh, auroric, um, and also it, it looks like it could possibly be nebulous. But if this is a nebula, this nebula measures, I don't know, 900 to 1,200,000 ,000 light years, like... It's like, we, I, I don't even want to go there. And like, what's happening down here? Look at these bubbles. So these bubbles have been seen for the first time tonight here by you and just recently by scientists. And this is because of radio astronomy. Look at that. These are up to 100 light years across. And they're sitting right in the center of our Milky Way by the big fake black hole that doesn't exist, um, which appears to be some type of amazing replication in the largest scale of exactly what David LaPointe point, uh, showed us in the, in the videos he put out almost seven years ago. This is simply a Z pinch, and you have the bubbles above and below. You can get jets out of here, and then you have material forming here on the inter the interface. But this is at a galactic scale. It's unimaginable. This is the most beautiful of – look at how small it gets. It's so beautiful. I am, I am jazzed. I, I don't use that word a lot. Just because of the amount of breakthroughs that have been happening, and it's the quickening. It's happening so quick that we're just revealing these bubbles. And look at this whirl here and this disk. Take a look at this for a while. Blow it up. Look at what's going on in here. And we're talking this distance is uh, 13 light years. Absolutely amazing. Dab worthy. Towering balloon-like structures discovered near the center of the Milky Way. Here's the paper, and I'll leave you the uh, I'll leave it for you. An international team of astronomers, including North Northwestern University's Farhud Yusef Zadeh, has discovered one of the largest structures ever observed in the Milky Way, and we were just tripping on it. A newly spotted pair of radio-emitting bubbles reach hundreds of light years tall, dwarfing all other structures in the central region of the galaxy. The team believes the enormous hourglass-shaped structure likely is the result of a phenomenally energetic burst that erupted near the Milky Way's supermassive black hole several million years ago. <laughs> Towering balls of balloons. Do you know why this paleolithic burial site is so strange? Because I never knew about it until tonight. Which is why I need to share it with you. The ancient internment site in Russia challenges us, everyone to rethink not only history. Yeah, all of history. Now, 
What I'm about to show you is a mummy, let's say, to the right here. And there are, oh, okay, these are ornamental arm scarves, but take a look at the beads. There are, oh, there are thousands of ivory mammoth beads, among other things, on this burial from the red ochre people, by the way, which are supposed to be 8,000 years old, but this mummy, this skeleton, this burial, whatever you want to call it, it's Paleolithic. It's 34,000 years old. And not only that, there's a child here buried with uh, in this burial and complete skulls which have are pretty elongated they're pretty large for skulls and like this is like some of the most important information in all of human history and you've never heard about it and you never will ivory beads and ochre affixed to the pelvic bones of a child, likely decorated the burial clothing of this 10-year-old interred at Sungir 34,000 years ago. Absolutely astonishing. The level of commitment to humanity or rituals or whatever was going on here. Just a beautiful example of human consciousness and how big the lie is. This is how people were buried 34,000 years ago. And we just learned how to farm 7,000 years ago. Okay. What's going on? I mean, look at this. Would you just look at it? Now, Let's get on with it. A rare harvest micromoon will light up the sky on Friday the 13th for the first time in 13 years, and it will last for 13 hours. Hours of powers. The United States hasn't experienced a nationwide full moon on this superstitious date since 2000. That's a wowzin. Go out and look up. That's as easy as it is, man. If you don't see this full moon, well, you know what you can do. Permaculture, soil science, and solutions is kicking some buttocks. Thank you for all of you that supported it. If you're not involved yet, do it now. Do a dab. Click the button. Back the project. At any level, just give a buck. Let's get the number of backers up to 200. And for those of you that actually want the book and or the course, do it now. Well, actually, you have a month. But the sooner you do it, the better because you motivate others. Now, if you hate me because I share these things and you're like, I don't have any money, Diamond. Fucking, you're such an asshole, man. You make me feel so small. Well, stop being such a crybaby and such a prick and uh, take some action. You don't need money to help support Matt or I. All you have to do is share our projects and our channel, share our videos, share our content, share this Kickstarter. If you have tons of social media sites, share it on 20 of them. That's like donating 20 bucks. Are you kidding me? You can do it. You don't have to back the project with your credit card. You can back it with your willpower and your love for Matt Powers and Diamond. Share it on Facebook. Share it on Twitter. Email it to someone you know would probably buy the book. It's that simple. It's all about dairy-free yogurt. I have no idea what that's there for. But it's all about it. Hope you got something out of the video. <laughs> Times are changing. And this channel is never rearranging. Proper prior planning prevents piss-poor performance. The flute is real.
Share this with like-minded people. Thank you to all of our Patreons, our one-time donors. Thanks for sticking with us. We love you. Be safe.